Welcome. You are listening to the Fat and Furious podcast. In this podcast series, your host, Steve Bennett, father of seven, best-selling author and adventurer, will be joined by 23 of the world's most forward-thinking medical professionals. Doctors, authors, and top nutritionists, where he'll share the truth behind living healthier and happier for longer. Today, I'm joined by dentist, Dr. James Gornick. James Gornick is an author. He runs a fabulous charity too. Uh, He's written a book on the foods that we should be eating to avoid problems with our teeth. And he has been twice voted the UK's number one dentist. And what we're going to find out in the next hour is what really, really does drive tooth decay. James, thanks for uh, jumping uh, uh, onto the podcast with me. How are you? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me back again. I always have fun. Our conversations are really interesting. When I get interviewed by other people, I have to write notes and things like that. With you, I never know where it's going. So it's just like, okay, where are we going today? Well, the great thing is, we're both in the same boat. I have never had a, a script or any idea where we're going to go. It's going to be around dentistry for sure. Uh, it's yeah. going to be around, uh, uh, but you can tell us a little bit about COVID and what lockdown was like and, and how you how, how treating patients has changed. But I really want to get people to really understand that actually dental work, fillings, extractions, that isn't the norm. It must be something that we're doing. Um, so let's dive straight in. Tell everybody about yourself, uh, uh, and you know, I've already told them that you're twice award-winning dentist, voted twice by your association as the number one dentist in the UK. I've said that twice now, um, but yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to blow your own trumpet. I've done it for you. Uh, but uh, tell everybody about yourself, uh, your practice, your brilliant uh, book, and also your charity project, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Steve. So I'm a I'm a dentist. So I spend four days a week uh, treating people, getting them over their fears of dentistry, uh, getting them a beautiful smile, getting them out of pain, um, and uh, rebuilding their their smile and their health. Uh, and the last three five years, I've really noticed a big connection with uh, more and more dental disease, more and more dental decay, and realizing that it's so frustrating that um, decay is a hundred percent preventable. It's all down to our diet. So I started researching uh, diet, nutrition, sugar, read every single book there is in the world about sugar. Uh, and that's how I met you, Steve. Um, and we've had lots of interesting conversations about health and nutrition and realizing that actually there was no dentist out there actually talking about nutrition and, and um, oral microbiome. And basically, um, people realize that the first thing you put in your mouth goes into your mouth and your teeth, uh, the first barriers and the saliva and everything else to what you're swallowing. Um, so started doing a lot more research on that. Um, I have a practice in the city called Bow Lane Dental Group. Um, we're fully private practice and we do everything for dental care. So whether you, you have gum disease, whether you want a straight teeth, teeth whitening, uh, just cleaning, we do it all. Uh, I've been going for 20 years now. Um, and then uh, about three years ago, I, when we were looking at uh, children and health and sugar and food, um, I set up a charity called The Rewards Project, looking at how we can reward people with things other than food and sugar. It's realizing that ingrained culture we have, uh, especially in the UK, about when somebody does well or uh, get, does good performance or does well in test, they reward themselves with a chocolate bar. And I'm thinking, there must be a better way. Uh, we're setting them up to fail going down uh, later on and, and thinking, well, what's going on here? What is happening? And it's it's really what's happening at birth and how we're bringing children up to then ingrain this behavior as adults. So they set up this charity rewards project and I work with a, a flavor enhancers and a nutritionist and also a, a recipe developer, uh, Charlotte Simpkins. And we looked at how we could take out the sugar in popular recipes like pasta sauce and things like that and actually make it healthier and taste better. And that was really exciting working in the kitchen because I'm, I'm an amateur chef. I like cooking, but uh, I'm not an expert, so using these experts around us to do that, and then that's when the book came out. So, book Kick Sugar, and it's got uh, 14 days worth of uh, recipes, so breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and how you can retain your palate. And from that, um, and you pay just 21 pounds 
uh, and you get access to all of this. And at the end of the 14 days, um, you lose weight, uh, your skin feels better, you have more energy, you sleep better, your memory is better, and basically you just feel better. And as a byproduct, um, your teeth and mouth are healthier and your dental bills go down. But you just have to have a reason to change. And for a lot of people, um, dental they don't want to have uh, dental treatment. They want to avoid the dentist. They want to avoid pain. They want to avoid paying for it. But actually realizing that actually dental decay is 100% preventable and you can stop this. So having conversations with thousands of our patients to say, look, okay, we found a cavity here. This is the cause of the cavity. And this is what we can do to stop it. Would you like to stop it? Or would you like me just to fill this tooth and come back again in six months and fill another tooth? And having that two-way dialogue has been really, really interesting and getting the feedback, which has then brought the book out and brought the challenge out. So we've tried it on thousands of people and it works. And then the, the money raised from the book goes to the Charity Rewards Project. And we're working with over 500 schools and nurseries now about how to get them sugar-free by 2023. That's our big goal, uh, getting them sugar-free by 2023. So hopefully, with your help, Steve, uh, we, can, we can do that. Definitely. Look, absolutely great introduction. Thank you for that. Brilliant. So let's jump straight off. <clears throat> One of the things that you've told me a couple of times, and I want you to share it with everybody, is the rate of children going into hospital uh, with teeth, you know, problems with their teeth. Could you tell us uh, exactly, exactly what I've told us before? But yeah. I think yeah, no. everybody needs to get this message. So, I mean, the number one uh, reason that children from the age of five to nine are admitted to hospital in the UK is for to have having teeth extracted from tooth decay. So it's purely reversible damage and they're having their teeth ripped out. And there's no reason for people to have teeth extracted at the ages between five and nine. And it's causing the NHS millions and millions of pounds. It's also causing lots of pain and unnecessary suffering. If any of your children have ever had toothache, it's not a nice thing. Um, and then having to go to hospital and be put to sleep to actually have a tooth ripped out uh, unnecessary is awful. And at that age, they don't choose what they're eating. They are a five-year-old, get given food at school or nursery um, and at home, and it's the parents that are buying it. So if they have got tooth decay, it is the parents giving them food that is not healthy and is not doing good for their body. So really, we're trying to educate parents to say, okay, what are the options to, to feed my child? Uh, they're not going to say, oh, well, they want a Mars bar. Well, don't give it to them. They screamed out for a cigarette or some drugs. You wouldn't give it to them. So just because they're screaming out for some chocolate, you shouldn't be giving to them. Uh, sugar is uh, used occasionally, uh, not an everyday thing. And it shouldn't be breakfast, lunch, and dinner as sweet things. And that's where we're going wrong. We have, As a culture, we seem to think that it's okay to have a big bowl of cereal in the morning and then wondering why half an hour later, you're hungry again. It's actually because it's not a satiating meal. It's not filling you up. It's full of rubbish. It's like almost like having a, a high-performance car of some sort. If you put rubbish fuel in it, you don't expect it to perform as well as if you put something good in it. And it's the same thing. So start your day by giving your children a good start. And that's one of the things that people say, well, I don't know what to have for breakfast. Well, uh, the book's got two weeks' worth of healthy breakfasts. You can play around with so many different things uh, make it fun, get them involved with the kitchen. And um, when I was talking to Jenny Phillips about it, it was it was more about trying to make the kitchen a nice environment to be in, a pleasant environment in, to be in. So you want to spend time with it. Get your kids into food, nutrition, and cooking so they know what they live in rather than just looking at a packet to see what the ingredients are. They want to know, okay, we're going to have eggs. Where do eggs come from? Let's show them how, where it comes from, what we're going to do. This is what the vegetable looks like in its raw state. We're going to wash it. We're going to chop it up. We're going to prepare it in different ways. Um, one of the things I loved in the book was the, the seven different ways to cook vegetables. You can roast them. You can saute them. You can stir fry them. There's so many different ways you can do it with vegetables, adding herbs and spices and just making it fun and exciting. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do is really get people back into the kitchen, cooking together making it fun and exciting. Okay, it takes longer than picking up the phone and, and ordering a, a KFC or something, but you're going to feel so much better for it afterwards. You know what's in it, um, and you can have fun, and you can really listen to your body and say, okay, when I had this, I felt awful, or when I had this, I didn't have as much energy as before, but when I had this, I had loads of energy, and I was so excited to get on with things. So um, listen to your body, 
try different things. Don't take everything out uh, and then wonder why, okay, well, I've got no nothing exciting uh, because it's all about enjoyment and fun. We don't want to have something restrictive. But I think once you start doing it and you realize the, the change and the great thing about teeth decay uh, and being a dentist is that decay um, happens in little as three months. So if somebody's diet is off kilter, within three months as dental professionals, we will notice the difference and say, hang on a second, what is happening in your diet? What's happened? And they go, well, actually, I'm going through a, a breakup or something and I've changed this or I'm working late at the office now and I'm just snacking and grazing throughout the day or something. We can actually notice it and say, okay, well, look, in your mouth, this is what I see. And the mouth is a barometer of the, your general health. I can see ulcers. I can see more bleeding gums. I can see more inflammation. I can notice your breath smells different, all these different things. And then listen to your dentist. Okay, well, what is happening? And the, what we do is then go through a diet sheet with them and say, okay, what are we doing first? Okay, let's change this and let's see how you feel. Okay, when I change this, I noticed there was less plaque building up on my teeth. Or when I noticed this, when I woke up in the morning, my breath smelled better. And looking at how we can do that. And, and, and that's one thing is going to a dentist is not just about uh, checking for tooth decay. We're checking for gum disease, but also we're checking for mouth cancers as well. Um, and there's obviously a massive increase in mouth cancer. If you smoke more, you drink more alcohol. And also now they're showing that actually sugar, increased sugar, increases the inflammation in your general body, uh, which means it's l less likely to uh, repair itself as quickly and it's more likely to be invaded by different uh, microorganisms. And uh, the research shows now on COVID is that uh, people that are uh, obese, people with type 2 diabetes, um, people with uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, do much worse when they catch COVID because their immune system isn't as strong and they have more inflammatory uh, markers, and, and they actually have a much higher death rate. And if you want to do something about boosting your immunity, the simplest thing to do is cut out the sugar um, and then start uh, looking after your body and listening to it as well. So um, as a dental care professional, we realized that uh, we were sort of not working as efficiently as we could do. So now we're doing a lot more video conferencing, video uh, consultations, telephone consultations. When somebody's coming in for treatment, we're trying to do things more efficiently and get in for their checkup and their hygiene at the same time rather than coming back twice. So they have to travel twice, we're trying to do dentistry in one visit rather than two visits if we can. And, uh, but also there's been some positive things about, as I said, nutrition and people are listening to their bodies a little bit more, maybe not traveling as much as they used to do. Uh, so we can actually have online conferences. Uh, so it's better for the environment. So there's been lots of positives out of it. And it almost it's like a, a reboot for the human generation is to say, look, guys, what you've been doing hasn't been working. Um, the death rate is increasing. We've got more obese people. We've got more children with type 2 diabetes than we've ever had before. Um, children are coming out of school less healthy than when they go into school. And that seems crazy to me because it's supposed to be a, a learning protective environment. We're trusting our children with the school system to come out better, more rounded, more educated, and hopefully healthier people. But what seems to be happening is they're coming out uh, less healthy and getting back into that sort of uh, pathway of, okay, now I'm not healthy. I'm going to the doctor. Now I'm taking um, uh, medication. And now the whole sort of cycle of the pharmacy and going into the, the hospital is putting more pressure on it, where actually if they were eating healthier foods, they would be coming off their medication. And like David Unwin has done a lot of great work on this, of getting people off type 2 diabetic medication by changing their diet and going lower carb. Uh, so if we can get people off medication and healthier by changing their diet, which is a quite a simple change and it's much more cost-effective, save the NHS millions of pounds on medication, but save you with all the complications you have because no medication has zero side effects. Uh, and then your, your teeth are healthier as well. It's a win-win for everybody. So I think in a way that this is a wake-up call. What can we learn from it? What is good to come out of it? What can we, when we go back into society and as we go back in, um, what has come out of it and what has helped and what hasn't helped? Uh, and look at that. I mean, in a way, there's been some good things about it. Um, I've noticed a lot, and I was just reading the article in Daily Mail this morning about um, over two-thirds of 
British people have put on weight since lockdown. Uh, and actually, a third of them have put over over half a stone on. Uh, and how they can look at actually shedding that. It seems to be that there's been sort of two parts of the population. There's been one part that's been really focused at uh, healthy eating, nutrition, and working different ways. If they can't go to the gym, how can they do their workouts and everything else? And there's been another part of the population who's just switched off, watched Netflix, and they at rubbish. And now that we're coming out of this and starting getting back into society again, is, okay, what can you do to get this out? And that's one of the things is, okay, do the 14-day sugar challenge um, and come out of lockdown actually looking better than you went into lockdown rather than looking worse. Some great stuff there. I want to pick up on one straight away. You said uh, yeah. <laughs> you said uh, uh, kids come out more rounded or we want them to come out more rounded. Yeah. I think they are coming out more rounded, just not the way you <laughs> intend them to come out more rounded. Um, next thing, I'm not going to pick up on uh, cereals I've kick the whatever yes. the ghoulies out of cereals for so many episodes uh what, what i do want to pick up on uh is bread because yeah. you told me something about bread which i disbelieved you when you told me i went home did the experiment and my god you're so right please yeah. tell everybody uh, the association between bread tooth decay and how you can do a little experiment to uh find out how quickly it turns into sugar yeah no thank you steve so uh yeah i'd like everyone here who's watching now uh, when you finish, go in the kitchen and find some bread. I'm sure you've got some sort of bread or bit of bread or something in the kitchen. Uh, break a bit off and chew it in your mouth for a minute. And I just want you to chew it. Don't swallow it and keep chewing and chewing it. And notice the flavor taste and what you notice over that period of time. And for some people, within 20 seconds, they really do notice that basically the saliva in your mouth uh, has an enzyme that breaks down the starch in the bread and turns it into sugar. And you will notice that as you chew the bread, it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. And you'll get to a stage where it tastes so sweet, you want to spit it out. And that is what you're swallowing. You are swallowing basically sugar. But most people don't chew it long enough to find that out. It goes in your digestive system and then it releases all the sugar into you as well. So actually, it's the bread and the white bread is the worst because it's got a higher starch content and that breaks down to sugar quicker. Um, and that causes tooth decay as well as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and all the rest of it, the things we talked about earlier on. So, um, And tooth decay, there's two things. People know about sugar and biscuits and think, well, I, I'm expecting those to cause tooth decay, but they don't seem to realize that actually bread, crisps, all these sort of carbs actually break down into sugar and cause tooth decay just the same. And actually, one of the worst culprits we've found actually for causing tooth decay, and it sounds a bit weird, is actually crisps. Uh, because they break down quite quickly into sugar, but also it sticks between your teeth um, and it takes a while for you to get it off. And a lot of people are walking around with bits of crisp stuck around their teeth for a few hours and that causes tooth decay. And, and, and there's actually four things that you need to cause tooth decay. Uh, number one is you need teeth. So if you've got no teeth, you've got dentures or something, then obviously no tooth decay. Um, the second thing is you need sugar or starch. So there's something that happens. You need to have a bacteria in your mouth. So everyone has bacteria in their mouth. It's a sort of symbiotic relationship. So some of the bacteria is good bacteria, some are bad bacteria, and it helps kill off other bacteria, and it protects you generally. So you don't want to have a, an environment that's got no bacteria, but some of the bacteria causes tooth decay more than others. And you might find that some couples come in and say, well, I eat the same diet as him, but whenever I come to the dentist, I need a cavity, but he doesn't. And that's just because you have different bacteria in your mouth. So if you've got the bacteria that causes uh, tooth decay, then the last factor, number four, is time. So it takes, as I said, about three months when your diet is, is full of carbohydrates or sugar to cause tooth decay. But actually, the biggest way, the quickest way you can get tooth decay is increase the frequency of your snacks. So if you're snacking three or four times a day, you're going to get tooth decay much quicker in Europe, you're just having one today. And, and this is what I did for my kids when I was bringing them up, was that, okay, I don't want to say you can't have sugar, you can't have sweets, you can't have that, because they're going to want it more. So we did it once a week. We had a movie night, and they could eat whatever they want for that sort of hour period. And they just cram the sweets in, whatever they want to do. And they feel like they've had it, and then they feel really sick and nauseous afterwards. And they go, yeah, Dad, you know what? Now I know why I don't eat that much sweets. Um, but actually not restricting it. And it's the frequency. So that's what I work on with my patients first is to cut down on the, the sugar and the carbohydrate, 
cut down on the frequency first, and that's one great way. If you've got a, if you're doing a diet sheet, um, you can write down what you do because for some reason the brain forgets all the different snacks you've had and the things you've had over the day. But if you actually physically write it down, go, ah, oh, I, I forgot I had that at ten o'clock, or I forgot I had this, or I forgot that. But actually physically write a diet sheet down and share it with your dental team. Um, and actually, the first thing to do is cut down on the frequency. So it's okay, well, you're having something sweet at, at breakfast. You're having something, uh, lots of bread at lunchtime. You're having this. What, what can we cut down first? And, and work together and say, okay, well, I'm going to change my breakfast and have this. So that's one less frequency of having the sugary things. And then how can we cut? Okay, we're going to go from white bread. We're going to go to wholemeal bread. Uh, we're going to go to soda bread or something else because that releases the sugar slower. And, and then just slowly wean yourself off things and, and, and notice how you feel. And, and I notice myself that if I have a dessert or something after a meal, I feel awful about 40 minutes later. And I still forget that, even though I know all about the sugar and I have teach people about this, I still forget it. So every couple of months I have a dessert, I go, wow, why did I feel like that? Oh, yeah, that's why I felt like that. And don't beat yourself up about it. Just acknowledge it. Remember what caused it. And say, okay, I'm going to remember that for next time. And then next time you'll hopefully learn from it and not repeat the same mistake again, because our bodies are so in tune. If you start listening to them and think, okay, this works for me when I do this, but this doesn't. So just remember the four things that cause tooth decay, teeth, time, um, the, sh the sugar as well, and the bacteria in your mouth. And, and, and scientists are working on uh, ways that we can cut down on the bacteria in our mouth, things like that. But the easiest thing you can do is change your diet. Uh, and Steve's got a lot of great books about that. We've written about it as well, the public health collaboration as well. And, it, and there's so many different diets out there and different ways of, life, of, of eating and different lifestyles. But just listen to your body, take something out and say, okay, what happens when I do this? And, and my wife is uh, gluten intolerant and she's noticed when she has this, she feels like that. Okay, I'm going to take that out. Okay, when I have this, how do I feel? Okay, I feel okay with that one. I'm going to put that back in. And and start playing around with it rather than just taking everything out and then sort of starting from scratch again. So have a look at that. It makes a massive difference, but also you're going to cut down your dental bills. You're going to feel a lot healthier. You're going to have much more fun in the kitchen, which is a really important. Um, and you're going to try lots of different flavors and tastes. And loads of research said that if you start your children off with lots of different flavors and tastes and spices and things like that, that their palate and as they get older, they won't become less fussy eaters uh, and they'll like experimenting on different things. And it'll be much easier uh, when you go out with them uh, to try those different foods rather than just that, okay, I only eat pasta. Well, actually, pasta is just a bowl of sugar, basically. Um, you're not going to feel really great afterwards. So what can we do to change that? And I know there's, there's loads of different recipes. The Caldees has done loads of different recipes out there. So just try different things. Um, it actually works out to be much cheaper to cook from, from fresh and from home uh, as well. But it's loads of fun. And that's what we're trying to do is I want people to have more fun. Um, I want to see uh, patients and do dental treatment, but I don't want people to do fillings. I don't like it when somebody comes in and says, okay, we've got a cavity here. When I say, well, I saw you uh, six months ago and we talked about your diet and nutrition. Now I'll just fill it up again. Well, no, that's not how it works. Eventually, there's, you're going to have no tooth left. So let's work together and see if we can change it. And most of the time, people will change if they've got pain, if they're having to pay extra to do some treatment, or there's a reason for change. They've noticed they're putting on weight, their trousers don't fit as well as they used to. Maybe they have to buy new clothes as well um, and think about how we can make that change and make it easier. And as I said, we've got um, on the Rewards Project uh, website, if you go to rewardsproject.org, you'll see loads of free resources about uh, uh, some recipe cards, uh, some um, uh, ways of uh, putting out your diet sheets and histories as well like that. There's ways of engaging with your schools and nurseries once the schools and nurseries open up again. Uh, so and we have this 14-day uh, kick sugar challenge. We've got over two and a half hours of different videos with different experts talking about how, what sugar does in your body uh, and how you can get over it. We've got a personal trainer, Pete Mack, who talks about um, – at what exercise and how you can do it. And one of the big things he was talking about is consistency. What we don't want to have is that you do no exercise for the whole week and on Saturday you go crazy and do three hours of cardiovascular disease. That's not how it works. It's about consistency. Can you do five minutes walk every single day and do that every day for a month? Okay, how do you feel after that? Let's do 10 minutes. Well, how do you feel after that? Let's put in some yoga or Pilates. In. How do you feel about that? It's all about being consistent with your diet 
being consistent with your exercise uh, and, and listening to your body and seeing what happens. James, loads of stuff I want to pick up on there. Absolutely fascinating. Now, let me go back to then the four things that you need to get tooth decay. Yeah. Uh, and teeth, <laughs> just put that one on one side. Yeah. So three <laughs> things. Uh, you mentioned that, that the food is obviously important, bacteria is important, and then you know the, that frequency. So let me just break that down a little bit. Uh, are we saying then that if, say, from the day dot, you were born, your teeth come in, and you avoided sort of the processed carbs and the sugar, you're actually very unlikely to get tooth decay? You will definitely not get tooth decay, 100% certain no tooth decay. Now, you can obviously have gum disease. It, uh, but not tooth decay. Tooth decay is purely 100% down to diet. It's completely uh, reversible as well, actually. So one interesting fact, and I've done an infographic about this, is that tooth decay, how it happens, it's basically the bacteria, you eat the sugar, the bacteria eat that, and the byproduct is acid. And if anyone, you remember your sort of chemistry experiments and when you're putting acid on different things, um, the first thing you do when you have acid on your teeth is you've got these little white flecks or white marks and some people, if they've had orthodontic treatment, may notice when they have their braces off, they notice these little white marks around. Uh, so that's the first stage that actually tooth decay is starting and there's too much acid in your diet. Then it goes to a brown stain. Then it turns into a little cavity and then it turns into a bigger cavity. And that's when you need to see a dentist. Now, if we get to this brown stage, um, we can reverse it. So we can reverse it by we stop the sugar and the carbohydrates. Uh, we start having more water. We start cleaning better. And you can actually reverse the cavity and your body can heal itself. Um, so you don't need to see a dentist from that. So we are helping you by spotting these things and try and change it. There's been loads of evidence about fluoride and fluoride in toothpaste and putting fluoride varnish that can accelerate the healing process as well. But you don't need it. And that's why I'm saying to people that actually, if your diet is good and you've cut down on the frequency of sugar and carbohydrates, then you can brush your teeth just with water. You don't need any sort of toothpaste at all. Um, a lot of the toothpaste out there have so many different artificial sweeteners and different ingredients. If you are a smoker or you have a lot of things that are colorants, if you have a lot of turmeric, you have a lot of tea and coffee and things like that, then your teeth will naturally stain because the enamel is quite porous. So then maybe you need a toothpaste with either a very mild abrasive, which will remove the stain, or one, you could get one with a, a peroxide, so a whitening agent, which will lift off the stain. Otherwise, obviously, see a healthcare professional who can do teeth whitening or when they do polishing and cleaning your teeth. But toothpaste really is unnecessary for that point of view. Um, really, you're just brushing to get rid of the food debris that's around, which is, can cause bad breath, but also um, to get rid of the bacteria that cause gum disease. And that's the number one reason we are brushing our teeth twice a day for two minutes is actually to get rid of the bacteria that causes gum disease because no matter how good your diet is, um, you are still prone uh, to some levels of gum disease, uh, depending obviously on the bacteria. Again, you may not have bacteria that cause gum disease, but a lot of the population does. And that's one of the most common uh, infections, bacterial infections in your mouth is actually from what we call gingivitis or inflammation of the gums. And if you start brushing your teeth and spit out and see some blood in the sink, uh, that's not things to say, oh, well, that's normal. That isn't normal. You shouldn't be bleeding. If any other part of your body bled, so if you sort of put your socks on in the morning and suddenly blood came out, you wouldn't think, oh, that's normal, then just wipe it off and carry on. Uh, the same thing is with your mouth as well. So if there is some bleeding, it shows the same inflammation. You start needing to clean a bit better. And if it still does bleed, then you go and see your hygienist or your dentist to show you. And usually it's the fact that you're, uh, uh, you're brushing not as effectively. And most people brush for about 30 seconds, 45 seconds. And actually the research says you need two minutes to brush properly. Um, and then you use something to get in between the teeth because the toothbrush can't get in between the teeth in any way. So you need to get something in there. Um, so you can use floss, uh, brush sticks, teepees. Um, any sort of uh, interproximal brush that you can find, which will get rid of that. And it also, if you do that for the first time and then smell it, it doesn't smell great. It smells sort of like rotten eggs. Uh, smell your floss afterwards, it doesn't smell great. So um, try and get something in regularly every day, either the morning or the evening, to get that off. And that will stop um, uh, gum disease, but it will not make any difference to tooth decay. I actually had a, a gentleman in yesterday 
and uh, he brought it. He brought his twelve-year-old uh, daughter in. And we were talking about it, and, and then we were talking about diet and things like that. And she said, "Oh, it's fine." Uh, every time she goes to a party, she brushes her teeth really well afterwards because she's had a lot of sugar. Uh, and then after breakfast, she brushes really well. That will stop it. I said, well, no, it doesn't. You can brush 50 times a day. If you're still having the sugar and carbohydrate, you're going to get tooth decay. Now, the brushing will get rid of the food particles, but it actually won't stop the tooth decay. It won't make any difference at all. So you're brushing and cleaning purely for gum disease, purely for getting rid of bad breath. Uh, and you can do that with just water. You don't need any sort of toothpaste. But said, if you are having a lot of staining agents, then it would be a good idea to have some sort of toothpaste. And if you are having a sugar and carbohydrate diet, which a lot of the population do, then a fluoride toothpaste is a good idea to slow down decay, but it will not stop it. So a really easy way of stopping it, really cheap way of stopping it, is just change the way you eat. Yeah, fascinating, mate. Absolutely fascinating. Right, next question. Um, this is what everyone knows about, or should know about. I think most people okay. know about. Is the fizzy sodas, the Coca Colas, the Pepsis as bad as, and the monster drinks? Are they as bad as everybody make out for the teeth? Simple answer: yes. <laughs> so there's two things we've got to concern about with those fizzy drinks. Uh, obviously, one is the sugar content because uh, you're going to get tooth decay, and they are basically liquid sugar. Um, and people do tend to sip them over a period of time. So we find that some people put a can of cola on their, on their desk and they're sipping it over a sort of 40-minute period. And basically, it's like dipping their teeth in sugar for 40 minutes. But the other thing that I'm really concerned about, and we're getting more and more, is the acid content in them. They're very, very acidic, and they will dissolve your teeth. And again, if you're drinking that cola over 40 minutes, it's basically like dipping your teeth in acid for 40 minutes. They will become thinner, they'll become grayer, they'll become more translucent, uh, they'll become much more sensitive. And that's what we're noticing. People come in, see us and saying, well, actually, my teeth never used to be sensitive, but they're really sensitive to cold things, sweet things, to sour things. I'm really noticing it. And there's been a massive spike in sensitive toothpaste sales because people are buying the sensitive toothpaste because they're, their teeth are becoming sensitive. And the reason they're becoming sensitive is because of their diet. So it's really, really important um, when you're having acidic things. And it is all, any carbonated drink has carbonic acid, and that goes the bubbles, and that is going to be very acidic. But some of them are worse than others. Uh, so really, what you want to do is, if you are having any of these drinks, you want to think about how can I neutralize the acid? Now, unlike um, the sweets and things like that, it, you can neutralize the acid yourself within 30 seconds. It's very simple. Quick swill of water for 30 seconds, uh, some cheese, um, anything that's neutral will get rid of that acid and get you back to sort of normal, neutral pH in your mouth. So uh, really important if you have your fizzy drinks, if you have it with a meal, have some food with it as well, have a swill with water for 30 seconds, have some chewing gum, that will uh, prevent a lot of the acid damage. It won't affect the sugar, but it will affect the acid damage. And we're noticing as dentists, there's a thing called tooth surface loss which is basically means your teeth are being dissolved from all the acids you're having. And there's been a big fad over the last three or four years with digestion and people having in the morning, they wake up and the, all they have for breakfast is hot water and lemon. And basically they're, they're, that is just basically dipping their teeth in acid again. Um, so it's really important to anything acidic, neutralize it as soon as you can, chewing gum, water, uh, cheese, something neutral. Um, that's the biggest thing. But obviously the, these drinks are packed full of sugar. They, but most of them, I mean, they're starting to ban them now for children because they've got more than the daily sugar allowance in sort of half a carton of it. But also they've got massive caffeine amounts as well. And really there's no nutritional benefit at all to them. Uh, if you want to, adults want to have caffeine to stay awake, then have tea or coffee or something else uh, rather than these artificial things to, to stimulate you then. Um, and I'm really sort of concerned about the damage that's happening uh, to people's bodies. And if you think about the enamel, the tooth teeth are the hardest structure in our bodies, harder than our bones. And if they can be dissolved by these drinks, can you imagine what they're doing to the rest of your insides, uh, slowly dissolving that and rotting it away? So be really, really careful with these uh, these uh, these fizzy drinks. I want to pick on two things just quickly there. Then, uh, what what about when you take the water out your filter machine, you put it in, and you use one of those. Uh, 
things that make it fizzy, does that affect the teeth or is that absolutely fine? In other words, yes. is, is fizzy yeah. water okay? Yeah, so, I mean, fizzy water is better than uh, the fizzy drinks and better than, obviously, uh, uh, the other things we talked about. But really, fizzy water is still carbonic acid and it's still very acidic. So what we do is we're getting people off fizzy drinks like Coca-Cola's and things like that. One of the steps is to go down to, okay, let's go to fizzy water. Let's put some uh, mint leaves in there yeah. or something else to give you some flavors. But it's a transition period. We really want people off that and just onto water okay. and milk. And then obviously herbal teas, you're fine with. Yep. But it's a frequency again. So if you're having a fizzy drink, fine once a week. It's not going to cause uh, major problems, but it's every day is the problem. Yeah, but uh, yeah, got it. But black, black and white, okay, selfishness now for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, all about me now. Um, if yeah, I've got a it. choice of plain water or uh, putting the, the bicarbonate, you know, the machiney thing to make it bubbly, yeah. better off going plain water. Better off plain water. Great one. That's a great one. And also you've said then, because I'm one of those people that do that most mornings, I have a slice of lemon uh, and a slice of ginger in there. Maybe drop the slice of lemon and just go with the ginger. So I would drop the lemon, uh, but also I would look at having a glass of normal water next to it. So have your water and lemon if you want, uh, lemon and ginger, and then just quick salt water afterwards to neutralize it all. Uh, that would definitely help. Or have it with a straw. That would make a difference as well. But yeah, the lemon on it. Is, is very acidic, so just be a bit careful with that, Steve. So we know uh, the breads, because we, we, we hate bread anyway at Primal. We hate cereals because of what they do and the advertising. Uh, we hate fizzy pops. We, we, we're good so far. Here's an interesting one. Uh, for many, many years, I used to give my kids and myself orange juices and apple juices as part of the morning breakfast routine because, of course, that's one of your five a day, only to be told by my own dentist uh, a couple of years later that's probably part of the problem. What's your view on the apple juices and the orange juices? Yes, ditch them as well. Uh, we say if you're having any fruit, have them as whole fruit. As soon as you juice them or do anything with them, you reduce the fiber massively and increase the sugar content hugely as well. And then they're very acidic as well. So um, if you're going to juice it, uh, we always try and say, well, let's do vegetable juices uh, or try and mix it 50-50, so fruit and vegetable as well. Have it when it's just been juiced. Uh, because the sugar content actually it ferments over time, so it actually gets sweeter over over the day. So if you can have it fresh as best as possible, but ideally you want to be having your water and having the ju the apple as an apple. And it's also this is the theme through the whole thing, and I know you're really into this one, as Steve as well. Is about real food. The more you muck around and change things and play around with it, the more you cause harm to your body when you take that product in. So if you can have that apple as an apple uh, rather than apple juice, um, your body will thank you hugely for it. That's great advice, great advice. Right, next question. Um, nature doesn't normally get things wrong, as in, you know, okay, there's appendices, we don't need them so much these days apparently, but nature doesn't normally get it wrong. Why does it give us four wisdom teeth that we then have to go and have them all taken out? I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Well, we're... <laughs> In about 2,000 years, no one will have any wisdom teeth because dentists have been taking them out and they've been causing so many problems. And we're slowly evolving. So we've evolved from being on all fours to standing up. And we're going to evolve as not having wisdom teeth. The original reason of having wisdom teeth was that it was almost a third set. So we would have the, uh, the baby teeth that would fall out at, from sort of six years old up to about 12 years old. And then we have the adult set. And then at 18 to 25, we'd have the last lot, which were the wisdom teeth. Um, and what's happened is our diet is not as uh, previously our diet was quite rough uh, and our teeth used to wear down a lot more than it is now. We've got a much more refined diet, whereas before we used to have all the things that um, they weren't as processed as before. We had real food, fresh that weren't, didn't have a lot of mucking around with. Now everything's been processed a lot, so our teeth don't wear down as much as we used to. So uh, we find that you can, there's no reason why you can't have your teeth the whole of your life. But uh, if you look at sort of prehistoric things, what happens is their teeth, they used to have uh, eat raw fruit and vegetables, didn't cook things as much, use their teeth as implements. They used to use them to cut things up and uh, sharpen things, so their teeth would wear down as you got older. As your teeth wore down, there was more space for the wisdom teeth to come through, and they were the last sort of four teeth to give you some extra chewing capacity. Nowadays, uh, all our teeth is 
all our food is more processed. We don't eat raw things out in the forest anymore. And we don't use our tool, teeth as tools anymore. So therefore, they stay with us our whole life. And we actually don't need wisdom teeth. And they cause loads of unnecessary pain and suffering. Um, and uh, so what, what's happening is we won't do that. And we talked about rest and price and how uh, things have changed uh, and how um, it's our diet that's making a huge difference to our facial form and the amount of crowding we have in our teeth and also that uh, wisdom teeth as well. So we're getting a lot more crowding than we ever used to do because our teeth are not wearing down. So therefore, we're having to see orthodontics to straighten them. And then we're having wisdom teeth. Uh, uh, taken out as well so uh, in a couple of thousand years time they won't no one will have wisdom teeth and won't be doing that but i'm hoping our diet will improve in a few years time rather than a few hundred thousand years time yeah great great advice and in fact you said uh, we used to use our teeth to to you know as implements you also told me once that actually is one of the most common reasons for people coming into the dentist is that we still do use them for opening bottles and things and yes. one of the number one reasons people come and see you is they've damaged their teeth They've damaged their teeth by opening things with bottles. Uh, and obviously, uh, when people are more drunk uh, or more desperate to get into their beer bottles, they use their teeth to open them up as well. Uh, around Christmas time, we get more damage from toffees and sweets that people don't normally eat as well. So it's very seasonal. But yeah, please um, don't use your teeth for anything rather than eating and talking. Get one of these uh, sellotape dispenser because uh, it sounds crazy. But uh, about once a week, I get somebody coming in who's chipped their front tooth from opening uh, a package or tearing sellotape. And it sounds really silly and innocuous, but just the angle that you do to put your teeth together and the pressure you put in to just tear the sellotape actually is enough to chip the enamel and break some part of your teeth. So um, teeth are used for eating, chewing, talking, uh, smiling, but not used for opening things if you want to use that for opening things get a bottle opener that's again brilliant brilliant advice so to look after the teeth and interesting i want to pick up on something then if uh sort of you know in primal days teeth were wearing down more if that's sort yeah. of a natural thing by eating things that are rougher tougher more fibrous and, and uncut things where we probably have cooked today if that's a natural thing to, for them to wear down that way does that in itself cause tooth decay or are they different things no, it doesn't cause tooth decay. So they, they wear down because the, the wearing is slow, uh, slow process. The body actually helps heal it. Uh, so as it wears down, uh, the dentine, which is the, the underneath the enamel, uh, gets harder and starts growing and repairing itself. So it protects the surface. So uh, slow uh, wear of your teeth causes no tooth decay and causes no problem. The, the problem we have is the fast wear. So that is with people who are bulimic, anorexic, who are doing a lot of reflux, acid indigestion, and obviously with a lot of the fizzy drinks and acidic drinks, because it's much faster, that can cause problems because the body can't cope and can't compensate quicker. But slower wear of your teeth, uh, that doesn't cause any problems at all. And they had virtually no decay. And we talked about this a while ago, but uh, when the, the London Crosswell project, uh, they were digging up uh, for the tunnels, um, they found a series of skeletons that were 300 years old. Um, and they looked at the skeletons of, of those Londoners in that area and compared to them to people that have recently died in that area and looked at the bone density and the teeth and the strength of the teeth and the amount of decay. And they found 300 years ago they had stronger bones, more dense bones, because they were chewing rough, natural things. Um, and also they had no tooth decay, uh, and very little gum disease as well because um, their diet was so different than it is now. So it's showing us that 300 years have passed. Uh, if we've got better medicine and dentistry, but our diet has gone really off kilter, um, and uh, we need to change that rapidly. If I, if I can come back, again, brilliant advice. If I can come back to uh, earlier on, you said you need four things for tooth decay, teeth, obviously. Uh, yeah. uh, you talked about um, you need sugar or carbs or anything that breaks down yeah. to sugar in the mouth. Then you sort of call about uh, the, the sort of microbiome within the mouth that you have good bacteria and bad bacteria. If you need the good guys in there, would that suggest that maybe mouthwashing with all that chemically stuff is not a good idea? Yeah, we don't recommend mouthwash uh, as a dental profession at all. Um, so we often use a mouthwash if you've had some sort of surgery in your mouth. 
or you've got some sort of uh, ulcer or you've got some sort of disease going on, we use it for short term only. What we don't want to do, and that's what we've noticed more, is a massive increase in antibiotic usage in this country. And there's more and more resistance to this, these antibiotics now. And we don't want people to have antibiotics for any teeth related issues because if you've got a tooth ache, there is something going on with that tooth. There's either a cavity or an infection going on with that tooth. And we want you to treat the, the cavity or the infection and not just give antibiotics to mask it. Um, and that's almost like a, a mouthwash. And we talk about mouthwash for us is almost like an aftershave or a perfume. If you're going to use it, to mask the flavor. So you had a curry the night before, had a lot of garlic. You can use it to mask that 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 flavor to get your breath uh, smelling better. But as an antimicrobial or as a as a as a as an advice to actually heal infections, things like that no regular use of mouthwash. What you're going to find is the back. You're going to get rid of the good bacteria. You get more of the bad bacteria, um, and it's just really just a, um, a guessing game. What will happen if you have that uh, mouthwash for a long enough and kill all the bacteria, what's going to come back? Are you going to get more bacteria that cause tooth decay, gum disease? You're going to get more resistant bacteria to, to antibiotics as well. So really, from my point of view, mouthwash is a no. Only use it as a deodorizer. And if your dentist has prescribed it, if you've just, say, had a tooth taken out and you're waiting for everything to heal or you've got some sort of infection. But actually, the best mouthwash ever made is salt water. So just a teaspoon of salt into a glass of warm water, rinsing for 30 seconds heals most things. And that's one thing that we get more of um, at the moment when there's a lot more stress going on and people are uncertain about their jobs and they're working a bit harder and their, their, their lifestyle has changed dramatically. We're getting an increase in mouth ulcers. Uh, and one of the, 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 the one of the reasons they stay longer is they often get secondary infected. So you get an ulcer in your mouth and then, you either put your finger in to touch it all the time and your finger's not clean or, or it gets infected and then you're having to do something about it. So what I would suggest if you do get a mouth ulcer, uh, first of all, don't put your finger in the mouth. If you want to put your finger in the mouth, make sure you clean it properly for sort of 20 seconds before you touch it um, and then use some sort of salt water is perfect. It's better than any other mouthwash you can buy. Use it twice a day uh, for a week. If you get an ulcer that hasn't then healed after two weeks, you then want to go and see your dental care professional because it could be something else. So um, always uh, go and see for advice after two weeks if, you, if it hasn't healed. But as I said, salt water is the best thing. Do not use any of these fancy uh, mouthwashes. They're going to cause a lot more problems than they, than they actually try and solve. Thank you for that. Um, next question. Um, there was, I can't remember the name of the book now, sadly, or even the author, but there was a book, and I've read so many hundreds of medical <laughs> books, but there was certainly a guy in the 60s or 70s that was talking about cancer and uh, root canal treatment, saying that root canal treatment was a no-no because actually uh, in there then it's an area for bacteria to build up over years and years and years. Is, is there any element of truth in that, and, or is that just complete nonsense? It's, it's nonsense. Basically, uh, there's root canal been, uh, treatment's been going on for a long time. When they first, dentists first did root canal treatment, they used to use some sort of paste in there. And, and then they went to silver points. And now we use a thing called gutta perca, which is actually a type of a tree bark. And basically what, what happens with uh, for people who are listeners who don't understand what root canal is, but basically what happens is if you have some sort of trauma to the tooth, the nerve can die and the nerve can, uh, carries blood vessels and nerve endings into your tooth. And that's what we use um, to repair itself. So we talked about earlier on, if you're grinding your teeth using a lot of acid or you've got early decay, your tooth can repair itself, but it can only repair itself if the nerve is still alive and healthy. So if you've had some sort of trauma to your tooth, whether that is an accident and you've broken, broken your tooth in half um, or you've got a lot of tooth decay, and it's got quite rapidly and the bacteria has got into the nerve, the nerve then gets infected. And then your options are either to have the tooth taken out and you have a gap or you replace it with something else or do what we call a root canal treatment, which basically is cleaning out the canal that used to house the nerve and the blood vessels, cleaning it, disinfecting it. And depending on which teeth, some teeth have got one canal, some have four canals, but so they're cleaned and disinfected. And once they're clean and disinfected, you basically have a hollow space and the body doesn't like spaces. So what you need to do is then 
fill that space with the material. And nowadays we use this a gutta perca. So it's placed in that material and then you put a filling or a crown or something over the top of it. And then the tooth is clinically dead, uh, but there's a ligament that holds the tooth to the bone. That's still alive. So when you bite on things, you can still see the pressure. The tooth can still move. Um, it still looks almost as good. What can happen over time is if the nerve has died and you've done a root canal treatment, um, because there's no blood flowing in it, the tooth can discolor and can get darker over time. And that's one thing to watch out for. And your dentist can either cover that with a veneer or can actually whiten that tooth with some sort of peroxide chemical to do that. But actually, uh, the tooth is a good tooth and will stay. And we get teeth that stay 25, 30 years after root canal. So the issue and what happened previously with this research is that if the root canal wasn't done correctly and some of the void was left in, there was still bacteria and the bacteria can then get reinfected and you can get an abscess or something on that tooth. So that was what first happened. And the research thought, oh, well, that was cancerous and things like that. It's actually been discredited now. And actually, a root canal treatment done by a specialist or done by a good dentist should last you the rest of your life. Um, once it's done correctly and you can still eat on that tooth through the rest of it, but it doesn't repair itself. So really want to do is if, if, if you think you might be having a problem, see a dentist, see if we can get it sealed, protected before it turns into a root canal treatment, because not only uh, does it take sort of a couple of hours to have a root canal treatment and obviously it's slightly more expensive than doing normal treatment, but also um, that tooth is then dead and can't repair itself. So really apart from sort of having sort of accidents and trauma, you shouldn't have tooth decay that causes um, uh, an abscess that causes a root canal because if you're going to a dentist regularly, they can catch tooth decay early with the white or the brown spots. Uh, so you don't end up having to have a root canal treatment to do that. So yes, if you need it, much better to have a root canal and cheaper to have a root canal than have a tooth taken out and have a gap, but really want to try and avoid them if we can at all times. And that is as said, a lot of it is down to diet. There are accidents. If you fall over in the playground and break your tooth, unfortunately, if the, the, the nerve's exposed and infected, then we need to seal it. But it's much better to save your tooth than have it taken out. Again, absolute fabulous advice. Um, and you're a parent of, of three. I've got a whole brood of them as well. Um, yeah. Why is it that probably the out of all my children, the one that eats, eats the least sweets, that she just gets in about carbohydrates so it doesn't have any or she has some, uh, maybe, or maybe I'm answering my own question here because she's had quite a few feelings <laughs> and the others haven't. Uh, maybe it's back to the date when she, days when she did have sweets. Or is there a bit of genetics or a bit of DNA or is it a bad look or do some people just have better enamel than others? Or It's, not, it's unlikely to be the enamel, especially if they've got the same parents. So it's more likely to be uh, down to the bacteria and she's just unlucky. She's got the bacteria that causes tooth decay. So her dentist needs to be more on it with her. She needs to come back more regularly. And that's the advice we give to some people. Some of my patients come back and see me every three months because they're higher risk or their diet is not as good. And some of my patients come and see me every two years because they're lower risk. So it sounds like uh, she's higher risk so she needs to go a bit more frequently. Uh, she needs to keep an eye on, on these things. And also she needs to be more cautious that if she is having the occasional biscuit or whatever, uh, she needs to sort of reduce the frequency as much as she can and she needs to be uh, a bit more on it so whenever she gets any early symptoms from tooth decay which may be some sensitivities to certain things or she notices some discoloration she needs to book in with the dentist sooner rather than waiting till her next checkup so I think it's all about unfortunately genetics there are susceptibility but she can actually uh, protect that there are things that her dentist can do so um what we can do is seal her teeth with a, uh, a resin to actually put a, a layer on there to protect them, to make them uh, more resistant to tooth decay. Uh, if she's having problems, one thing she could do is uh, up the fluoride content in her toothpaste or use a fluoride mouth rinse as well. So there are different things that we can do, but uh, the bottom line is that something that you just needs to be a bit more vigilant and her for her to be checked more often um but it's just luck of the draw i think you've got five kids haven't you steve seven my friend seven seven. sorry (laughs) missed it well one out of seven's not bad so you've done pretty well so (laughs) now here's here's one that i'm confused about and maybe you can enlighten me um i always remember my grandparents in their sort of 60s taking their false teeth out put them in the jar 
Okay, that's one thing. And then my mum and dad don't, and they're 80, so they've avoided that somehow. But I keep right. saying our diet's getting worse and worse and worse as a human race. It's what, wait, what, I know for a fact my mum and dad eat worse than my grandparents did. So it, it counter goes against my argument that diets are getting worse if more people are keeping their teeth, or is that just that now people go to the dentist more often or brushing your teeth is more common? Well, they're going to the dentist more often. Uh, also, majority of toothpaste, over 90% of toothpaste in the UK sold has got fluoride in, which is a protective thing to cut down on tooth decay and slow down the decay. Also, is, uh, from previous generations' grandparents, one of their things was when they got married or, or one of the gifts were often uh, go to the dentist, have all your teeth pulled out and put dentures in. So people thought that actually dentures were better than your natural teeth. So there were lots of people having gifts of go to the dentist, have all your teeth taken out and put dentures in. And people thought, especially if they had a little bit of crowding or discolored teeth and they didn't like their teeth, uh, rather than go to the orthodontist, have them straightened, which was more expensive and took longer, it was cheaper just to put them out. So I think that generation tended to go to dentures thinking dentures were better. But uh, we all know that, and I've treated thousands of patients with dentures, that they're not as comfortable as natural teeth. You don't get the same feeling as natural teeth. Tastes and flavors are different as well. Um, and there aren't zero maintenance. They're made of plastic. They do need uh, repairing and adjusting as your, your mouth changes and you don't have the same um, um, enjoyment of foods with dentures as well. So I think it's that that generation has changed in that respect. But yes, uh, obviously it's also down to individuals. So some people can eat sugary things and don't have as much uh, as decay. And that, again, we talked about that earlier on about bacteria as well. But really, we want to try and keep your teeth as long as possible. Um, people used to go, go now go to the dentist a bit more than they used to do. So dentists can spot early decay and signs of disease and reverse it quicker than they used to do because they used to think, well, just take them all out, set dentures, and you won't have to bother going to the dentist anymore, which has obviously changed dramatically. Uh, we're spotting um, mouth cancer a lot more uh, frequently as well. In the UK, every day, 24 cases of mouth cancer are being diagnosed. Uh, and uh, that's something that we're, we're, we're managing to get in earlier to treat mouth cancer. It's very easy to treat at an early stage and uh, has much better life expectancy. Whereas uh, a few generations ago, people were dying from mouth cancer because they had an ulcer and they didn't get it checked and it turned it quite nasty and they ended up dying from it. So uh, really, really important to go regularly to dentists to get, even if your diet is great, get checked for mouth cancer, make sure everything is doing well and work together so you don't ever have a root canal, don't ever have to have dentures because uh, as a dentist, I can never replace what God's made as teeth uh, as well as uh, as they have. So really, really important. Brilliant. Uh, Elliot, I want you to go split the screen. We're going to play a game together. We've never done a game before. Okay. So, okay. yes, no okay. answers only, uh, whether they cause tooth decay. Ready? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm ready. You, said I, you went off a bit, so yes, okay. no answers. Yes, yes, no game. Yeah. Whether they cause tooth decay. Uh, you can have a neutral if you want as well. Okay, go. Broccoli. No. Eggs. No. Chocolate. Yes, well, it depends on the chocolate. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> if, I guess if it says seventy percent, it's okay, or eighty percent, but not seventy and above. And that's one thing we have in the book is trying to get people off off the dairy milks, which are about forty percent chocolate, going right up to. I mean, I have ninety percent now, and I actually love it as much as I used to like the dairy milk. So it's a, it's a just it's a, a journey to experience yeah. the flavors and the excitements of chocolate. Brilliant. Right, next question. Uh, manufacturer that owns this brand, sue me, not James. I asked the question. James just answered. Can cornflakes cause tooth decay? Yes. Good. Toast? Yes. Salmon? No. Asparagus? No. Well, we're doing good. Uh, cabbage? No. Cauliflower? No. White rice? Yes. Pasta? Yes. Okay, it's a great game. You've got them all right so far, I think. <laughs> I got a friend, but the, a friend option. But, but, the, but the point is quite a serious point then. You know, it is carbs and it is sugar that cause tooth decay. And if you were just to eat 
wholesome, natural food that's not being messed with, that maybe grew in your own garden and, and so on, you know, you can keep those teeth longer and they can self-repair if they get a little bit of decay as you catch it fast enough. So what we're saying to parents and to everybody, you know, that you can keep these forever. You know, you can, that whole thing about health span, you know, we want to, we want to live longer, but most importantly, we want more life in our years. We want to be enjoying it for as long as we can. And part of that enjoyment is keeping your own teeth. Therefore, eat the right things makes a big, big difference. Exactly. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, I've got one more before you, before you go. And I'll try yeah, to get you on for hours. Um, no, no. Um, we keep talking acid, 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 acid. I'm a big fan of filtering my water at home. And one of the benefits it says on the jug is it takes it from being, uh, it drops it, I think, one on the pH scale. Does, yeah. does that help a little bit, make sure your water's not as acidic? Yes, no, definitely. I mean, you've got to you test it. You've got to test it. Ideally, you can have a little pH meter or you can have the little dipsticks to check the pH of the water. Uh, basically, anything around 5 pH that's slightly acidic, so neutral is 7, so anything from 5 or below will decay your teeth or dissolve your teeth. So if you check the pH, as long as it's not below five, it won't affect your teeth. Uh, and there's been loads of stuff, and I think you've been talking to people about microbiome and things like that. And actually, um, what we want to do actually is like make it slightly alkaline, so above the seven, so eight. But yeah, just try all the waters. And I know some people who try loads of different bottled waters, and there's a massive difference of the pH in non-fizzy bottled water. That ideally, if you if it's not on the on the jar you can test it and see okay what ph is and you worry above five yeah so that can also make a difference for your teeth fascinating isn't yeah. it fascinating stuff and i, I guess well, in fact, i keep saying final question just final one so really you know i mean you are a doctor anyway but you 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 probably can spot things because you said earlier on a great thing you know if your teeth are wearing down because of the fizzy pop imagine and that and the enamel's really hard imagine what's happening inside but in one sense, you're that eyepiece in, in, into somebody's health, probably before a doctor normally. Yeah, well, most people go to the dentist more than they go to the doctors. They go to the doctors usually um, uh, if they've got a problem, uh, whereas we get people who come to the dentist for routine checks and health screenings, and we can spot them if they're, they're early signs of uh, pregnancy. We can spot in their mouth beforehand. We can spot vitamin deficiencies as well. We can spot early diabetes. Uh, we can spot so many different hormone imbalances uh, by the change in their mouth. And it's easier for me to spot them if I've seen them when they're healthy at first. If I've seen somebody and I see them a couple of years later and I can compare the photographs and the x-rays and say, well, actually, I saw you two years ago and your gum uh, texture looked like this, but now it looks like this. There's something going on here. And then starting sending them back to the doctor and having a screening and find that they're vitamin B12 deficient or zinc, uh, their levels of zinc are higher or there's a vitamin C deficiency. There's so many different things that we can spot by looking in their mouth because the mouth is sort of a barometer of your general health as well. So if you can keep your mouth health healthy, then uh, the rest of your body will follow suit. So really important, go to your dentist and your hygienist regularly. If something doesn't feel right in the mouth, go to your dentist first, get them to spot it, uh, see what's going on, get them to take photographs and review it. If you've got an ulcer that's been there for more than 14 days, Go and see a dentist to see that. Uh, we can spot so many different things and we can help you work together to actually become healthier. Absolutely fabulous, James. Three things then. So you, the book, which is truly brilliant, written or co-written or helped with, uh, you've got Jenny Phillips in here, who I think is absolutely yeah. wonderful. Uh, really good read for people. Your chocolate cake, and yes, we did say chocolate cake because you yes. can make a primal chocolate, a chocolate cake. cake. Uh, is. is legendary because I have tried it. Some things in here that you've done that others haven't done, which I like really well, is you break down the sort of uh, different tastes and, and, and the different, uh, the, you know, the bit of the science behind it I think is fantastic. So yeah, really good read for everybody. And remember, all the profits go to charity. Keep doing what you do with sports relief and comic relief and all those things yeah. as well. But also things like this, you buy it and the money goes to charity and you get some benefit yeah. from it. So yeah. definitely a book worth reading. And then if anybody's in or around London that wants to, uh, you know, come and see your, you and your brilliant team, uh, then the name of your surgery again? Uh, Bolane Dental Group. So in you fact, can look on the website, isn't Bolane Dental. Isn't surgery a terrible word? I know, it's scary, <laughs> I used the wrong it? word there. It's not surgery at all. Right. <laughs> Dental Group. 
five. That's Dental Group. Come along. And also, Anna, you kindly selling a book online for you. So if you want to get the book, go on to Primal Living. You'll find the book there. I'm sure uh, Steve will put the link in. Uh, but yeah, he's kindly selling the book from us online. And also, if you want to take the 14-day sugar challenge, again, you get the book. You get two and a half hours of videos. You get interviews. And you get a, a private Facebook community for the first 14 days. So we can help uh, become accountable and help you with all the experts involved in the book. Uh, they're all there online to help you with questions, uh, recipes you want to change or something, ways that you want to change your uh, behavior. Linda's on there as well. So uh, it's just uh, 21 pounds for the two weeks and you get a copy, signed copy of the book as well with that. Uh, so have a look at rewardsproject.org. Uh, thank you again, Steve. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, we get loads of interesting questions from your readers. So if anyone's got any dental-related questions, uh, especially now down COVID, there's lots of dentists that haven't managed to reopen because they had problems getting PPE. So very happy to help you get you through that stage and get you healthy again. That's great, James. Thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me back again. See you guys soon. Thanks, James. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.